Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data Webinar Series with Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss machine learning update and overview of technology maturity and product vendors. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions by Twitter using hashtag smart data. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage area includes cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impacts of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give it to Adrian to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. As usual, it's an adventure just being here. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, if you missed Shannon's earlier message, I'm literally semi in the dark here. We've been without power for, uh, oh, about 14 hours. So uh, it's, it's just been fun trying to get online. Uh, happy to be here anyway, happy to be uh, with you today to talk about machine learning. And the plan today is to go over, uh, kind of put machine learning in context and talk about the, uh, the maturation of some of the technologies involved, and then do a brief overview of uh, the market for commercial products and services in machine learning. So with that in mind, um, I didn't originally plan to, uh, to do any definitions of terms, but yesterday I was reading a report from a, a um, research firm that will go unnamed, and they so butchered the distinction between artificial intelligence and machine learning and data science that I thought I better uh, uh, put things, uh, put a framework around it so that we're all talking about the same thing. So with that in mind, the way I look at the world is that artificial intelligence is the, the broadest of the, uh, the categories here. And AI, uh, historically going back to the 50s, has been uh, a discipline that brings in ideas and techniques uh, and some algorithms from a variety of disciplines. Uh, but in general, it refers to an approach to problem solving, uh, things that we once associate, associated with uh, the human brain. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're really talking about um, machine-oriented systems or solutions that perform uh, human cognitive-like functions. So I'll get into that in just a minute. But within that, machine learning refers to uh, systems that improve their performance on some artificial intelligence tasks based on experience with data. So machine learning uh, is the part of artificial intelligence that deals with uh, self-learning, if you will, or self-improvement rather than additional uh, input from the system developer. So if a system is running and gets some experience and improves its performance along some dimension, uh, then we would say that the system is learning. If the system is running and we get some experience with it and say, oh, we need to change a rule, and the programmer or developer changes that or a user, uh, then that's not machine learning. That's the system is learning, but then you would think of the, uh, the human in the loop. And within machine learning, deep learning, we'll get into quite a bit today, uh, is a biologically inspired approach that uses multiple layers of abstraction. Uh, modeling with something that looks like a neural net. Data science is outside that, and data science is 
uh, really looking at um, uh, analytics and the relationship between them is that you can use uh, AI techniques for data science, you can certainly use machine learning, you can use deep learning, but you don't need data science to do artificial intelligence. And for many things with data science, you don't need artificial intelligence. So I just want to uh, set the stage here. So what we want to focus on today is the big green box. Having said that, looking kind of at the, the evolution, if you will, the classic problems in AI, again, going back to the, uh, the early days, involve perception, understanding, learning, and a lot in problem solving with communication between human and machine done in natural language. So classic AI uh, is looking at all those problems. When I think of modern AI, it's the same problems, but we've also applied these deep learning techniques and big data. So someone was asking me recently, you know, what what's new? And it's not that the types of problems that we're dealing with are different. It's the approaches that we're able to take because we have um, available to us large uh, data sets and the infrastructure to process that data. And that enables deep learning and that enables to solve the same problem in a different way. Uh, kind of wrapping up the, the context here in the next couple of slides. <coughs> Excuse me. When we think of uh, AI as sort of the overall uh, picture, within AI, uh, the area that we generally refer to as cognitive computing involves understanding, reasoning, and learning. And the model, uh, forgive me if you've been with me on some of the other uh, webinars, I, I really focus on the idea of a model. The model uh, includes your algorithms, but also your assumptions. So it may be implicit, it may be uh, explicit, but any assumptions you make about the way the data is structured or uh, the forms of things, that all goes into the model. Now the, the talk today is on machine learning. So you might think it's just that learn part within the center. But in fact, it's really just about impossible to separate learning from understanding and to get from data to some representation, we need to be able to uh, apply some reasoning. So last one on in this section here. What we're looking at is uh, for machine learning, we need to be able to um, have a representation of the data. This is often what we think of as our, our knowledge representation. So it's not just ones and zeros, it's identifying context and meaning. I've expanded that here into you know, intent and emotions. So it's, it's kind of a multi-dimensional representation of uh, the domain that we're working on. And that would be a different, um, the same data coming in uh, from the outside, the same string of words or uh, utterances may be interpreted differently the way we understand it based on the context, so based on who's saying something. And uh, we're certainly expanding that these days with uh, perceptive input. So even the same words in the same, from the same person may be interpreted differently with uh, additional information uh, derived about their emotions or about the, the context. Now, the reason this is important when we start to think about machine learning is if we're going to take a system and we're going to measure its performance based on uh, how accurate it is, perhaps in identifying something within a larger data set or identifying um, uh, categorization or classification of data or finding patterns and you want to improve the performance, then you have to have a way of uh, objectively measuring that performance. And to do that, we have to have a good understanding of the representation of the data. And hopefully in a minute, when I get through uh, this piece and get into the, um, the way we're doing things with uh, deep learning, you'll see that the representation is really very important. So the mnemonic I use for cognitive computing is URL, because it's easy to remember, understand, reason, and learn. 
But more and more in talking to people about the actual learning part, the R can stand for representation. So it's, you have to understand something and you do that by uh, representing it. And then as you change the, um, the data that's being represented, that in fact is learning. So that's where it fits. Now let's look at uh, a couple of the major design choices here. And this is important, not just uh, historically, you may look at it and go, well, we all do it one way now. But uh, the fact is that there are multiple ways to approach the idea of machine learning. In the example here, the, the page is from the Azure uh, Machine Learning Studio, but there are any number of different approaches or different um, platforms that we will talk about in a few minutes. The difference that I'm trying to get people to think about here is that we can either represent the data and the patterns explicitly using symbolic logic or other types of representations so that we can um, plug those into mechanical theorem proving, you're, you're dealing with formal logic, or as a starting point, uh, have things that are more, you might think of them as raw data, whether it's structured or semi-structured or uh, unstructured. I will say that all data is structured, it's just a question of how much effort you have to put in to find the structure. But uh, the idea is if we treat words and natural language coming in as uh, binary representations of the words, so the system as the words come in don't assign any meaning to them, they just assign a numeric value. So if you were to parse uh, everything I'm saying right now and just put that into uh, computer memory, each individual word would have uh, no value by itself until you analyze it in the context of the entire statement. And that's when you start to get into statistical models instead of the uh, symbolic representation. <coughs> Excuse me. What we'll see is that uh, most things are actually hybrids. So even if you're using a statistical model, at some point you're assigning meaning to it. But early on, we need to, to kind of look at that and this fits in with the idea of the model. So if we're gonna do learning, we have to have a model. If we're gonna do the model, we have to understand uh, what assumptions we're making. Are we assuming, uh, at what point are we assuming that we understand uh, the meaning of the input? It could be something where, uh, let's say we're building a system that uh, uses a natural language front end, uses something like a, a modern chatbot, and we can constrain the input so that even if we allow somebody to give free form English as input, we're only looking for certain keywords or certain phrases. Uh, or we could say, we're gonna do a statistical model, let them say anything they want, and then analyze it in context over a very large data set and create our own representation. The, uh, the simple model here is just to show that even if we start with a logical um, model in mind, so we assign some value to, or uh, some meaning to each word, when it gets stored in computer memory, and it doesn't matter uh, for the purpose of this, um, this diagram, whether we're dealing with you know, sequential memory, whether we're dealing with associative memory, whether we're dealing with uh, bits or qubits, there's going to be a, um, a logical representation in memory for each of the pieces of data that we're concerned with. And the idea of this diagram is to show that if we have these words coming in, if the purpose of the system is to do autocorrect or uh, an autocomplete on your phone, for example, you may want to look at the words differently and position them differently in this arbitrary end space than you would if you were mapping for meaning. So if you're mapping for, uh, to autocorrect and you don't wanna to have to look at a lot of context, uh, part of your model, part of your assumption as you're uh, learning here might be that uh, the, the words that a person is more likely to have to type the right number of letters 
than the right letter. And then you start to look for things like, well, the most common error is that the left thumb is going to be off by one letter to the left, and the right thumb may be off by one letter to the right. And so the way we represent these things is going to be very different if we're trying to have that simple autocomplete autocorrect. Then if we're trying to do, even if it's a, an autocorrect versus meaning, then we have to understand what each word means, uh, what each word, uh, what the intent is, and we'll store things differently. So here we're storing things on the right um, by concept or intent, and on the left it's just mechanically. So that's important because as we're uh, trying to learn, we need to have that uh, fairly well recognized in the model. Now, um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Normally I have a mute or cough button, but uh, since we're doing everything on the iPad today, I don't. Um, the change over time has been from focusing very heavily on the, the knowledge, if you will, of the system designer. Uh, so that there's a, there's a lot of emphasis on the understanding and that goes into the rules and the algorithms and the data is just, I don't want to say along for the ride, but uh, the, the heavy lifting, if you will, was done up front. Whereas today, moving along from left to right, uh, with the advent of uh, big data architectures and solutions, everything from Hadoop to Spark, uh, and the hardware that goes with it all, we're starting to see systems that are lighter weight in terms of algorithms, fewer rules, and the systems themselves, the learning systems, are learning based on discovery of patterns in the data. So machine learning over the course of the last couple of decades has moved very much from the left to the right. So machine learning in um, uh, knowledge-based systems or expert systems of the late 80s, the early 90s, things that are still widely in use, um, things haven't gone away. But in that case, you would try and capture the knowledge of an expert uh, either explicitly or by watching them, um, by uh, self-reporting, that type of thing. And so in the structure of the system, when the system first launched, there would be a lot of information that is codified in the rules and the algorithms. And so machine learning in a system like that, one, let's say, to the left of the, uh, the center dot there, machine learning would consist of either, well, learning would consist of either machine learning or humans changing the rules. Machine learning in, um, in that case, this is uh, certainly not what we would think of as deep learning, but machine learning would be the case where the system could identify rules and change its own rules based on the difference between what it expected to see in terms of results uh, or feedback perhaps and what it actually saw. So you can update rules um, based on experience. As we move further to the right, now we're getting a lot of uh, investment in deep learning. It's certainly become kind of the de facto approach to machine learning. <coughs> Excuse me. And as a result, systems have uh, smaller and smaller upfront um, emphasis on identifying the rules and identifying the uh, uh, specific new algorithms for the application. And what the focus is on is uh, on approaches to uh, things like feature identification and extraction, uh, which would be, I don't want to say it's easier, um, but it's certainly less human intensive. Uh, the emphasis is on getting the sufficient data and training data and labeling data so that I put at, uh, at the bottom in the purple. So that's the, kind of the shift as we go from, uh, you notice this isn't uh, labeled by date, but anything to the left of the, uh, the first vertical line, you know, we're, we're talking the 50s, 60s, 
uh, 70s, and as we move over, the second vertical line basically represents where we were from the uh, end of the last century, if you will, to now. And I would say right now we're at the point where most of the investment, most of the, um, the applications are being built uh, sort of to the right of that line. Everything is focused on machine learning based on larger data sets. Right. Now backtrack, much of it. There's still cases where, uh, where we don't want to be using deep learning and where we have more information that can be codified um, early in the design phase. Um, I use this diagram a lot uh, to show the difference or the distinction between discovering or identifying or classifying and understanding. Because when we talk about learning, uh, as I said, there are three things that have to go together. You have to um, understand, you have to reason uh, using representation, and then you can learn. But understanding, just as we, uh, we say artificial or artificial intelligence, sometimes augmented intelligence, but artificial means to me that it's simulating or emulating the process, we can treat the process of, um, of understanding as a black box. Uh, for those of you that uh, have studied psychology, I'm talking about something that's more like a behavioral approach. We don't need to understand the inside as long as we can map a set of inputs to a set of outputs, we're finding the relationships. And in this diagram, the system that uh, has been developed by Loop AI Labs can identify uh, relationships based on statistical modeling. Uh, so it goes back to that early decision without uh, being concerned even by what natural language is being used. So it's a purely uh, mathematical modeling, if you will, in end space to find things that are related to each other based on frequency and based on um, usage. In this case, it happens to be something that was um, published in, in Al Jazeera and the, uh, the system went through and looked for relationships and patterns. And although I don't speak the language, I recognize the numbers, uh, it happened to be uh, something that was uh, focused on uh, aircraft. So you can see a lot of uh, Boeing designations there, Airbus designations. But the reason that's important is to understand that when we talk about learning, and machine learning uh, specifically, the machine, the, the definition, the working definition for learning is that it's improving its performance. It doesn't have to understand things or represent things in the same way a human does. So uh, machine learning uh, is, is a measure of performance improvement along a dimension that has to be specified. And a lot of it today is uh, based on recognizing these concepts, recognizing, representing, um, and, and reasoning to find concepts that work together using a mathematical model. And again, it's absolutely irrelevant uh, to most of these systems whether the relationships are stored in a way that humans would store it um, reasoned about in the way that humans would do it. Uh, it has to be something that is, however, uh, mathematically complete, consistent, and the rules would have to be unambiguous, even if the human doesn't know them. So this is just one example where we do so much with natural language. Uh, this points out that we don't really need to um, understand or even consider the language for certain types of learning applications. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the overall landscape. Now we're gonna dive in and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, look at what the, the considerations are and how mature each of these is, and then look at some of the vendors. So when I was uh, laying out the, the framework for this talk, uh, what I wanted to do was have people think about uh, what is practical to use today. And I'll just 
uh, state flat out that within this diagram, which represents sort of the whole landscape, if you will, of machine learning, uh, everything here is above what I consider to be the, the threshold of usability. Uh, but some are more, some are more equal than others in uh, Orwell's terms. So we want to break the world up into four quadrants: supervised and unsupervised learning, and general and deep learning. And the idea is that supervised machine learning is learning by example, where we use training data, and versus unsupervised, where we're trying to discover patterns based on experience with data but without um, sort of uh, prejudicing, if you will, uh, the algorithms and to say, this is what you're looking for. It's like, look for things and then tell me what you're finding. Uh, it's a little more detailed than that, but uh, you know, for the purposes today, those are kind of the two big differences. With supervised, we have to have uh, labeled training data. And so there's more, um, more guidance up front, if you will, of supervision. And I think it's usually instructive when we think of uh, learning to think about how we deal with uh, teaching. You know, learning is one side of the equation, teaching is the other. And so if you're dealing with uh, trying to teach children how to do things, and you think about supervised learning versus unsupervised learning, uh, supervised would be giving examples and then having them try to generalize from the examples. Uh, unsupervised is having them go out and play and see what they find and then try and um, try and assemble theories from that. Within supervised, the idea of reinforcement learning, it's very much like reinforcement in psychology, which is that the system will have to develop strategies based on feedback that we give for its performance. And if we're dealing with uh, reinforcement learning for a human or uh, an other um, animal, if we're dealing even with rats in a maze, uh, reinforcement is generally that, uh, something that is a reward or the absence of reward is uh, negative reinforcement. Uh, negative reinforcement isn't punishment, it's taking away a reward. And so systems learn to improve their performance and develop strategies and develop changes to the algorithms Again, based on experience, all of this is based on experience. And so the system can change its behavior based on the frequency with which it receives a positive reward. And so that would be something that would be um, useful perhaps for uh, an application where there are just too many rules to be able to specify all of the possible uh, scenarios, things like um, specifying behavior for an autonomous uh, helicopter. You can uh, tell it what not to do, that's the reinforcement. And uh, sometimes I use the example for training manuals for fighter pilots. This is where you get into prioritization, right? There are only uh, half a dozen priority rules. There are a lot of little rules, but basically it's, you know, don't hit anything in the air or anything on the ground. And then you start to work down from that. So. Uh, each of those has a value associated with it. You could also use this for uh, a system that's playing a game. If you're playing uh, chess, for example, chess is a two-person perfect information zero-sum game. Uh, both players or both systems have perfect information about what the other person is doing and what they could do. And each move um, has a resulting value associated with it. So that value would reinforce or extinguish the behavior. If you do something today, if you do something uh, in a particular context and it results in a bad outcome, uh, one of your pieces is taken, then that would be providing uh, the negative reinforcement. So that's the supervised versus unsupervised. Both of these, uh, again, in terms of machine learning, the important part of it is that the change that we make to the system is based on the system uh, evaluating data over time and changing its behavior. And by behavior, uh, that would also include just changing the knowledge that it has. It doesn't have to actually do something uh, to change behavior. And the distinction between uh, general all of that could be done just with uh, 
uh, a set of business rules. But when we get into deep learning, that's more specifically uh, based on models that are analogous to human neurosynaptic um, events. So it's biologically inspired. We have um, layers of processing units that are very simple. Uh, each one, each unit within the layer um, has a limited range of um, behaviors, if you will, or responses to stimuli. But we have enough of them that the layers can collaborate and solve these more complex problems. And for that, I'm just going to do a couple of quick slides. And then we'll start to look at the uh, what's changing, and then look at the market. So in an artificial neural net, and this is a pretty uh, simplified view of the world, this is one layer. Each of the dots represents a neural processor. And you can think of that as something that uh, is aware of a particular type of stimulus. If it was an actual neuron, the stimulus could be uh, anything that we perceive naturally. So it could be uh, light, heat, um, uh, humidity, whatever we have, uh, perceptrons, if you will, to acknowledge. In an artificial neural network, uh, if we just had the one layer, then the input is a representation of the state that we're in. And that representation is digital. I think of it as a, a, a vector or a scalar um, that provides an input to each of those or some set or subset of these neural processors. But what uh, makes it interesting is the way they connect with each other. So in this case, we're not talking deep learning, we're just talking about the simplest. We have, um, think of it as a, a matrix of these, and perhaps uh, we can wire them different ways, um, but let's just assume for the moment that uh, every uh, little processor is wired to three or four nearest neighbors. And when it gets a signal from uh, the outside, maybe it tells all of its neighbors, maybe it just tells one, uh, that part is kind of the, the hardwiring, if you will, of the neurons. But where it gets deep is where we have that uh, input. Those are the observable uh, variables. And if we're, we're thinking about this um, in a particular application, let's say we're doing image processing now, um, then that's where you're looking at the pixel level, right? And if we just had one layer, you can't do that much with it. But if we start to say, okay, at the first layer, we're, uh, we're, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we're dealing with something that's low abstraction. We're looking at pixels there. They may have one of uh, 10 possible color values. They may have different shades, hues, um, but each one maps to it and say, okay, what am I seeing there? So that's not uh, very abstract. What you're trying to do is from that identify features and pull it out to say what's the relationship. Now we're, you know, in this example, I'm looking for um, edges to begin with. So if I'm looking at uh, at a digital representation, I'm looking at a JPEG file, for example, that represents a picture of my family. Then the first layer may just be looking for edges. It'll be looking for changes um, in in pixel um, color, it may be looking for borders, boundaries, maybe looking for uh, change in contrast. And once we've done that, we've sort of outlined that rough shape, we we'll go in looking, uh, using rules of geometry for going from one layer to the next. It's like, okay, well, I see that, you know, there's a shape here, and now I'm trying to figure out what shape it is. And if it's very structured, if you will, if it's a picture of, um, a crisp, in-focus picture of a building, then maybe it's easy to find the lines. Then we can go from that to identifying what the um, what the lines represent. When it gets a little fuzzier, then it's more difficult. We may have to have more layers. But here, just with the, this example where I've got five layers, it's that's the depth of the model. And the output is um, something that is much more abstract. I'm looking at a picture of a cat, of a person. Um, and again, this is 
very simplified, obviously, uh, for those of you that are familiar with things like convolutional neural networks. There's a lot of uh, back propagation. There's data that's going back up um, between the layers. We do a lot of uh, checking and, and validating. But if you think about it as a, a, a general model, we're going from something that is very concrete, pixel layer, to something that's uh, much more abstract. It's a representation of an object. Now, one of the problems is when we get into uh, systems that have many, many layers, and I've seen systems with over 100 you know, hidden layers. Uh, I think one of the ones that Microsoft has been talking about recently in terms of uh, translation is about 150 layers. It gets very difficult to, to go back and say, well, how did you, what evidence did you use for coming to the conclusion that the, um, the abstract item uh, is X? Can we trace back? And that is difficult. And in some cases that doesn't matter. But in some cases, let's say we're doing medical diagnostics, you may really want to know what did you see in the x-ray, and the x-ray is the very concrete um, digital representation of uh, some slice of a human being that made you, uh, that led you to a particular diagnosis. And we do have kind of a gray area, no pun intended, when we're dealing with x-rays, but there's a gray area now in terms of being able to go back. Um, it's not as easy as it was when we were dealing with a set of rules and you could just see which rule fired. But when you're dealing with a system that's doing self-learning, that's more difficult. So as we start to look at which type of machine learning we're going to use, uh, one of the uh, design considerations or decisions you need to do, you need to consider is uh, what level of explainability do we need? And this is an area that, that's undergoing a lot of uh, research at the moment. So I, I would say we're, we're getting more mature in terms of our ability to do that. But anytime that you add a requirement for an audit trail, if you will, or a potential audit trail, you're adding um, processing overhead. So um, <clears throat> I, I know that just showing a picture of my kids doesn't make them tax deductible, but it makes me laugh here. Uh, in this picture, if you were to uh, use machine learning to try and identify the objects, it would probably find three faces. And the way it's finding faces is you're looking for the edges, you're looking uh, for things like eyes, the mouth, the nose, and saying, okay, well, those kind of cluster together. Uh, you could do image recognition, and if you uh, had it properly trained, you'd be able to detect that one of those is wearing a uh, Yankee hat and two are wearing Red Sox hat, so that may be the difference. Um, in a picture like this, you could have uh, different genders. It could be all sorts of things that are different, but it would depend on the context which one you want to put a value on. So context is, is really king. What isn't shown here is that if I were to take this picture and modify it, let's say, turn one of the heads upside down, the typical deep learning system wouldn't recognize that that was any different, you know, if I turn it into a Picasso, than a picture where everything was in its place. Because it's typically looking for uh, features, but not geospatial relationships between those features. And that's important because uh, a lot of what we're looking at today as we get into more complex um, problems that we're trying to solve with machine learning and deep learning, the, the, the limitations of going from abstract to, um, I'm sorry, going from concrete to abstract uh, is that we're not giving the systems enough information about these spatial relationships. And so there's been uh, quite a bit of work done recently that is it's kind of changing the way, uh, I think it's gonna have a big impact on uh, the way we do deep learning. And for that, just take one, one more quick look here. 
what would a deep learning system today, multiple layers, learn from this picture? Um, this happens to be, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in downtown Atlanta in a rainstorm. And Shannon, I don't know if I've used this one before, but this was at EDW last year when I got stuck in the hotel for two days because we, nobody could get out of Atlanta. Um, but you can find edges. Uh, people are very good at finding edges. You can recognize the park if you've been there before. But the raindrops on the glass are actually more challenging than anything else. And so the, the reason I put the slide in is to say, okay, as we start to look at it, if you were to take this and uh, take the same picture from a different angle, it's going to look like a different place, even though it's, um, it's just a different view. If we, um, as, as long as it's, um, sorry, not uh, subverting nature, deep learning systems could figure out that it was the same, but it would be a lot of effort. Whereas for a human, when we look at this, it makes no difference if I move 10 feet to the left, 20 feet to the right, up or down. That's the same problem. And so even though we don't have to solve uh, machine learning problems the way humans do, uh, we should be able to learn from the ways uh, humans actually interpret these images. And that's where things are starting to go. So that's so a, a kind of a roundabout way. And this is one of those slides where I don't expect anybody to read this um, until you get a copy of the slides. I just wanted to show that there is an emerging alternative to conventional, if you will, uh, deep learning with um, neural nets and convolutional neural networks. And that's the idea of capsules. And a lot of the work is coming from uh, Jeffrey Hinton's group out of uh, Canada. Uh, Hinton, of course, is uh, certainly one of the premier thinkers, if you will, in the whole area of deep learning. But one of the problems that has been addressed recently that uh, his research team is working on is the idea that um, neural networks have in the past uh, each of the individual processing units is outputting a, um, a single value. And in his new work with capsules, it's still a neural network um, idea, but they're clustered and they're arranged differently and they're interpreted differently and they're connected differently, if you will, so that the uh, processing units can output a complete vector. And you know, I, don't know if this is going to help, but if you're familiar at all with uh, quantum computing and the idea of qubits rather than bits, uh, it's similar in that you're getting more value out of uh, the individual processor. So instead of aiming for the viewpoint invariance here, the, it's the last part that I think is important. This is um, the bold part is mine, it's not theirs that we're looking for um, replicated feature defect detectors uh, using these capsules or encapsulation, if you will, uh, into a vector of informative outputs. And the idea and the reason I, I bring it up today is that while we've reached the point now that um, even though there's still some gray areas in terms of interpretation, the performance of what we think of today as um, conventional deep learning, even though it's so relatively new in practice, um, we understand going from the concrete to the abstract. We understand um, building in that feedback loop to be able to change the values um, of the connections between these neurons. There is this frontier right now of capsule-oriented networks that I think is going to have a huge impact on the field in the next five years. And so I wanted to include it here so that I could um, talk about how mature each of the uh, technologies are. And so with that in mind, if we go from ad hoc where everything is hard-coded in terms of uh, machine learning through the rules phase, 
through neural networks, which would include deep learning into capsules. My thought today, and I've used the variants on this maturity model in the past, the idea is that with investment, with research, with uh, feedback, if you will, uh, technologies typically follow an S-curve. I'm trying to simplify it here. And at some point, they reach the point where you're getting um, reasonable utility out of them. That's the, the horizontal bar there. So I'm saying that all three of those have, um, have reached that point right now. We know enough about machine learning. We know enough about the alternatives to build these ad hoc systems, to build rule-based systems. And we're still building those. We're still embedding those um, in applications. The neural networks, the, the width here is where I see the investment. We're not going to do much more, uh, relatively speaking, with rules or ad hoc systems. We're still going to do more. But capsule networks is where I think we're going to see the most investment in the next several years, although right now they're way down here. In fact, in terms of the height, it would be lower, but I couldn't make it lower uh, using the graphic tool or the arrow would have disappeared. Um, so the idea is that we're mature. We're still going to see quite a bit of investment with conventional neural networks. But for the next five years, I think the big effort here is going to be on looking at this other dimension with capsules. Um, OK. Yeah, that's another, um, another paper from that group. I went backwards. Now let's get into the market and we'll do the next 10 minutes just looking at the market. So if you're convinced and you say, I'm going to build a system, I want to use machine learning uh, with or without deep learning, right now, these are the big four, uh, Amazon, Google, IBM, and Microsoft. And the reason I put them together is that uh, basically all four have uh, cloud native um, Machine learning platforms are all very scalable. You can start with any one of them for a relatively low price. There's a lot of investment there, and they give you the flexibility. So I tried to break it up into three simple um, dimensions. Uh, ease of use, the breadth of services that are offered on each of these platforms, and then the depth of services from the company. So uh, if we look at it, um, Using this the, on the ease of use scale, I think that uh, Amazon with AWS and Microsoft with the Azure Machine Learning Studio are probably the easiest to, uh, to use and to get started. Um, in terms of the breadth of services, uh, IBM and Microsoft probably have the broadest offerings at the moment. Uh, Amazon is kind of picking up the pace. And then in terms of depth, I think Frankly, there's a, a big gap between what IBM has done uh, with Watson and the others, but Microsoft with the Azure Machine Learning Studio is really um, picking up the pace. Um, I just finished writing something about uh, Microsoft's AI strategy, and their AI is basically uh, one of the three pillars of Microsoft's overall strategy going along with um, uh, sorry, mixed reality and, and quantum computing. Their machine learning or uh, AI overall is going to be in everything they do. So I expect Microsoft to, to be on par uh, very shortly and lead um, Google and, and uh, Amazon in those areas. Um, like many things in, in this space, uh, the reason there's no uh, tick marks on there is that uh, a lot of this is based on interaction with the companies and with people that are using these products. And so it's hard to actually quantify. But I will say that one of the things to look for in uh, a platform provider is the types of data that they can provide, not just the types of services. I mean, any one of these uh, platforms, you can get algorithms for um, Supervised, unsupervised learning and uh, deep learning. You can assemble things uh, via APIs. What's interesting is that some of the companies are making huge bets on data, like IBM with the uh, the weather company, uh, 
um, data that they acquired. Microsoft, by um, acquiring LinkedIn, has a, a lot of data. Google, obviously, has a lot of data um, from searches. Uh, and so the question is, which of those are available to you? Uh, in Google's case, most of that is available to them. And Google and Amazon uh, have done more to leverage um, AI internally than they have to expose it to clients. Uh, IBM and Microsoft, I think, are uh, have been more um, uh, focused on creating tools for others to do it. I'm going to go just through a couple of um, firms that are out there in the market that I think are are noteworthy at this point, and uh, these are intentionally organized in alphabetical order because I don't want to try and uh, rank them. There's too much uh, subjective. Um, uh, it's too subjective a nature. Uh, but I have uh, two slides with companies that I think you should take a look at if you're interested in building these systems. So Alteryx, Big ML, Cognitive Scale, and H2O here. I want to point out here is uh, just some um, thoughts on each. And if people have questions afterwards, uh, happy to discuss this one on one in terms of you know what fits for a particular application. But Alteryx is interesting because uh, they have a focus on uh, business users or what's uh, often known today as citizen data scientists, uh, people whose primary um, job responsibility isn't the nitty gritty of uh, data science. Big ML has a combination of a uh, private deployment model and a subscription model. So if you work with them uh, to develop your models, uh, they create a, a virtual private cloud and then it runs on Amazon or Azure or Google. And that, that's something that a lot of uh, firms are doing now. It's building uh, the application to run on multiple platforms. Cognitive scale, I thought was interesting uh, because it was an original investment uh, from the IBM Watson um, Venture Fund uh, as they were uh, ramping up and developing their augmented intelligence platform. Uh, but recently, they took an investment from Microsoft. Uh, it's the first uh, firm that I've seen that's, that's had those two investments um, in a serious way. So that's why I'm, I'm following them pretty closely. H2O, the uh, H2O Compute Engine, is a pure open source platform. And to me, they're, uh, in spirit anyway, they're the, the red hat of, um, of this market today. Next, uh, Loop AI. Uh, I mentioned their Q platform, the ones that have a natural language independent reasoning uh, engine. And I will say that in my role as um, analyst for um, Aragon last year, uh, I put Loop AI in for a, uh, an innovation award for machine uh, learning platform. So I think quite highly of them in what they're doing. SkyMind. Uh, Leveraging Spark, again, from the open source community. And I had to put this up there because it's their word, productionize. Uh, trying to create an enterprise-friendly um, platform for leveraging these uh, open source uh, products. Skytree, uh, the other side of the coin, rather than focusing on the um, citizen data scientists, is focusing on machine learning as a service for the high-end folks in, in data science. And lastly, Spark Cognition is uh, one of the leaders in developing custom solutions uh, with deep learning. I'm going to uh, wrap it up here and open for questions in just a second by saying that there are two companies or two approaches out there that are quite different from all the others. And uh, Intel Saffron, Intel acquired a company called Saffron, um, their machine learning, their reasoning and representation is all based on um, an associative memory model. So the way things are uh, stored is based on uh, the um, associative memory, which um, in simplest terms, uh, the storage location is assigned based on um, uh, an algorithm for 
how closely related two items are. And they're the only ones that I've seen recently that are trying to commercialize this. And I think that the investment from Intel uh, is going to pay some dividends. And so I, I look forward to seeing what they do in the next couple of years. And lastly, I'm wrapping it up with Numenta. Numenta is um, largely uh, an IP portfolio company at this point, I would say, because they're not trying to productize things themselves. But Numenta has done some of the most interesting fundamental research into the human neocortex and attempting to organize um, a computing system uh, their model they call the hierarchical temporal memory model, the HTM, uh, based on their understanding of the human cortex. And they've just done some amazing work at the fundamental level that I know is being um, incorporated into some products and is certainly being studied by a lot of folks now as a different way of organizing data uh, to optimize reasoning. And as I said right at the beginning, you don't have to do things the way humans do, but the move from um, conventional deep learning to capsulized deep learning is trying to benefit from uh, kind of tilting your head and looking at things differently. The work that they're doing at Numenta, I think, is going to pay off um, in a big way. So those, that's the second of the uh, the learning approaches that I would I hesitate to to say bet on because uh, I've occasionally said had people say whoa I took your stock tip well this is not a stock tip this is a technology tip I think that the capsule approach and the Numenta HTM approach are the two uh, kind of leading lights conceptually. Uh, to take us to the next level in machine learning. And having said that, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. Uh, just note, as Shannon said at the beginning, uh, one of my, my passions right now is working on this new book called The Age of Reasoning, where I'm looking at the intersection, if you will, of cognitive computing, the understanding, reasoning, and learning with the IoT and cloud computing to help people build distributed intelligent systems. So if you're interested in that, check out uh, our new site, and I would be, love to talk to you about uh, what we're doing. Adrian, thank you so much, and thanks for for all the work to get logged in while you're out of um, power and such in the Northeast there. So um, just a reminder to all the attendees, I will be sending a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving right into questions here in the Q&A section, uh, Adrian, how do you evaluate how well unsupervised machine learning is doing, and can you do that? Can I evaluate how well it's doing? Um, yeah. hmm. Well, I would say um, one really good example of an application that's well suited to unsupervised learning is things like um, network monitoring and looking for intrusion, because at that point uh, you have perhaps a lot of sensors and you're not telling it to look for something specific, you're asking the system to report on what it's seeing, and a lot of times uh, what you get in an unsupervised learning situation is um, just a, a flag, basically. Okay, I've seen something that I haven't seen before. You didn't tell me to look for this, you told me just to look, um, if that makes sense. And so unsupervised learning is being used quite successfully in that type of system. It's also used in um, uh, in fraud detection when you're looking for anomalies. Um, typically for something like fraud, you're gonna use a combination of supervised and unsupervised because you're gonna tell it to look for specific patterns, but you're also gonna tell it to look for novel patterns. All righty, well that actually brings us to the top of the hour and that was actually what um, the extent of the question so far. Adrian, okay. again, thank you so much for working 
so hard to to make this webinar happen today despite being without power. We really appreciate it and thanks to our attendees. Uh, oh, for my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we hope to see you all on the flip side as Adrian is showing there. We've got uh, knowledge as a service in April. So we hope you can, oh, we've got, uh, I'll make, we've got a couple questions coming in, but I'll get those over to you. Um, and maybe you can answer those in the follow-up email to that will go out on Monday okay. as we are right at the top of the hour. Thank you. Um, thanks all. And thanks everybody. Again, Adrian, thank you so much. And um, we will see you on the flip side. Sounds good. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.